philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles and recognize the angels that walk among us. Circumstance places you in the right place at the right time, and the result is good fortune. Fate crosses your path with a stranger, and your future is dramatically altered. You act on instinct or intuition, and a life is changed or even saved. I'm Robert Culp. When life takes a positive turn, many of us credit luck or fate. But what about those instances that cannot be explained away as coincidence or chance. When do we recognize such unlikely occurrences as miracles? For the next hour, sit back and consider these cases, cases that defy nature and reason, and decide for yourself. Could it be a miracle? You can't stand on a corner and be sure an angel will walk by or even sit on a doorstep and wait, confident you will witness a miracle. But you can sit back in your home and consider the stories of miracles, angels, and unexplained events we have to share during the next hour. Hello, and welcome to Could It Be a Miracle? I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer. And I'm Bob Evans, producer. The Miracle Research team has been hard at work selecting miracles for today's show. Our segments include the story of a lonely street person and the surprising part he plays at a holiday gathering. Is time an obstacle when a miraculous intervention is needed? We'll have a story in which the laws of time and space are altered to save a life. A woman, distraught about her father's death, finds a new sense of peace after encountering a face from beyond. A swimming pool provides a hazardous location for a life-reaffirming occurrence. And a story which begins with the miracle of birth ends in an even more amazing manner. For our first story, Bob spoke to author Brad Steiger. That's right, Michelle. I had the opportunity recently to sit down and talk with Brad Steiger. He and his wife are the authors of many books on the subject of the miraculous, angels, and the supernatural. He told me this story of a man who had to deal with one of life's everyday occurrences, car problems. This story is from our book, Angels Around the World. And it deals with the phenomenon, if you will, of the inner voice that warns. And it's a voice that we all should learn to listen to, whether we say it comes from our own higher self, comes from an angel, comes from God. We need to learn to listen to that inner voice. A.R., he's in California, and he's been invited to the home of an old college friend for dinner. So it's on the, the freeway. And then all of a sudden, he hears that voice. Stop the car. And again, it's quite polite, but emphatic. Stop the car. Okay, 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 okay. I am going to stop the car. I'm pulling over. I'm pulling over. Here we go. Here we go. We're going.
How you doing, pal? I don't know. Got a problem, huh? You know, I don't know. There's just something wrong with the car. Huh. Nice car. No warning lights, nothing like that? Nothing. Uh, why don't you start it up for me? All right. What do you think? You see anything? You want to give me a minute, buddy? I just got here. You heard any strange noises coming out the car or anything? No, nothing. Hasn't been giving you any trouble at all, huh? No, nothing. You know, I just had a stroke. Don't tell me. There's something wrong with the car, right? Right, right. I got that. I got to tell you, pal, I can't find anything wrong with it. All the same, could you just go ahead and tow my car for me? It's going to cost you 65 bucks. That's no problem. It's your money. So the tow truck driver, I mean, what's it to him, you know, if this is, <laughs> he gets paid regardless. So he says, okay, get in the cab. You know, most people would get real mad if I told them I had to tow their car. And then you come along, hell, you insist I tow it. Like I said, there's something wrong with the car. Yeah. Well, if you're so smart, maybe you should try and become a mechanic. He cranks it up. They haven't gone but a few feet, and the transmission falls out of the car. Now, not only would A.R. have been killed, quite likely, but it could have been a 10, 12 car pileup if he had continued to drive and that transmission had fallen out when he was going at a high rate of speed. So once again, as crazy as it seemed to A.R., and even crazier to the tow truck driver that a voice told him to pull over when ostensibly nothing was wrong with the car, that inner voice saved his life. And it's a lesson we can all profit from. We can all learn to listen to the inner voice, as I say, regardless of whether we think it comes from an angel, a higher self, or from God. But there is that inner knowing, that inner awareness that can save our lives. You know, Michelle, as I reviewed this case, I was reminded of something Lily Tomlin once said. Why is it that when we talk to God, it's called praying, and when God talks to us, we're called schizophrenic? I really have to wonder how many people would defy logic and pull off the road. How many of us would listen to such a voice? According to our experts, angels interact with us in whatever way they believe will allow them to get their message across. In this case, a voice repeated three times was enough to convince A.R. Thompson to listen. And he is convinced that the voice he heard was his guardian angel. Coming up next, a homeless man finds his place in the world with the help of another heavenly voice. When we come back. Welcome back. Sometimes the miraculous happens in a very ordinary way to very ordinary people, people society would least expect. As in our next story, told to me by Sophie Burnham, author of A Book of Angels and Angel Letters. There's no dramatic rescue story here. Instead, what takes place is an incredible transformation, which perhaps occurs only in the company of a miracle. Now, I think that everybody has angels. So the question is, can we see them? Or will we notice them when they come? There's a minister in New York Hugh Heldesby, who's the rector, I think he still is the rector, at the Church of Heavenly Rest on Fifth Avenue and 90th Street. And there was a homeless man who lived in this church, or who spent a lot of time in this church. I can't say he lived there, but he spent a great deal of time there, and he was a down-and-out bum. He smelled, he drank alcohol, he, you know, he was just an abusive street person. Excuse me. 
Hi, I'm from the welfare office. I don't think I've talked to you before. What's your name? I'm here to offer you some help. There are some shelters I could refer you to. And if you're hungry and want some food, then... Oh, wait. Please wait. I just want to talk to you. Is everything all right? I was just trying to help that man. Have you seen him before? Yes. I'm a social worker, and I wanted to tell him about some of our services, but I'm not sure he could hear me. Does he talk? Not that I know of. Well, if he comes back, would you call me? Certainly. Say, perhaps you could be my first leaflet taker. Excuse me? I'm distributing these leaflets around the neighborhood. They're invitations to our Christmas party, and you're welcome. Well, thank you. I'd love to come. And don't worry. You don't have to B-Y-O-H-W. Bring your own holy water. That's a little pastor humor there. <laughs> well, thank you again. One Christmas, the congregation were having cookies and coffee after one of the Christmas services. And it's a wonderful thing that you've been doing here. By the way. Oh, Merry thank Christmas. you, and Merry Christmas. Pastor, our firm's heard you want to start a fund for disabled children. Yes, for a long time now, the congregation has wanted to send some disabled children to a special camp. Well, we've passed around our own plate, and we'd like for you to have this. Oh, this generous contribution is going to make a lot of kids happy this summer. Thank you, Mr. Braxton. Please call me Jared. And believe me, the pleasure is all ours. It's a good feeling to give something back to the community, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, Keith? Keith! Uh, why don't you get a picture of the pastor and myself over here? Uh, my firm passes out a monthly newsletter. I, I hope you don't mind. Oh, of course. Besides, it'll be great publicity for the church. I see. Uh, <clears throat> looks like this guy's at the wrong party. And he really smells, too, you know? Uh, Keith, hold it just a second. There's a certain person here who really shouldn't be in the shot. Could you get him out of here? Oh, I understand completely. Yes, I can get him out of here. But you should know that if he leaves, I leave. He belongs here. He's been a member of this parish for 10 years. I see. I'm terribly sorry I asked. I understand. And they suddenly heard out in the church this rapturous, ravishing music. Someone was singing, O Holy Night, and singing it so beautifully that everybody stopped. It said it was the singing of angels. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Who is that? What a magnificent voice. I'll show you. Come in and listen to the fellow you thought shouldn't be here. We call him our messenger. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh. was born, O oh, night divine, O oh, night, O oh, night divine. Everyone has some place in this earth. Everyone has some uh, joy to give. <laughs> Maybe there's an overriding message in this story, that it's easy to lose track of what is really important in life, like having compassion for others. Even Sophie acknowledges that the miracle here is subtle, but something definitely happened to Phil, and he changed those people at the church. All this from a man that no one knew could even speak. When we come back, a covered wagon crossing the American frontier takes a wrong turn into the future. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
Our next story comes to us from the pages of a history book. In the Old West, moving across the country in a covered wagon was a challenge. Such famous routes as the Oregon and Santa Fe trails were littered with crosses marking the graves of men, women, and children. Our next story hints at a miraculous rescue for a group of frontier seekers, a rescue taking them to another time into the future. The year was 1849. The place, Death Valley. As the travelers had all but used up their last water reserves, now there was only enough for two or three days. It would have to be rationed carefully if they were to survive. Sarah, water deer. Just about all out. We better take stock of what to do. My figures are right. We should be about 30 miles from Fort Mojave. Yeah. We'd all die of thirst before we got there. Well, then I suggest you and I take off by foot. We can make it there and back a lot faster. You're in charge now, Joseph. Keep everybody out the of the The group's sun. leader, Isaac Toole, turned the reins of command over to his eldest son. And he and Philemon Gibbs headed off for Fort Mojave. The heat in Death Valley is unbearable. Yet Isaac and Philemon walked on, each torturous step taking them further from those whose lives depended on them. What happened next is unexplainable. Strange as what they saw was, Isaac and Philemon knew that at least there were other people at this place. Attic! Y'all must be working on that movie down the way, huh? Sir? Never mind. What can I do for you? We're in desperate need of some water, sir. Come on in, we got plenty of water. The attendant knew that a film crew was making a movie oh, in the water. nearby hills, and he assumed Isaac and Philemon so were in period in costume for a scene from that film. So he immediately showed them the water he had set aside for the many drivers who came seeking help for their automobile radiators. Sir, we've gotten disoriented. Can you tell us how to get to Sacramento? It's north of here, that away. You know, you two are almost believable. Well, help yourselves to the water. It's like soft glass. Isaac and Philemon found everything they needed. Water, directions, even a bounty of fresh fruit. But they both knew that even with the two-day return journey that now lay ahead of them, every moment could count now where the families were concerned. We don't have any money. This? It's gotta do. What do you suppose that is? Some sort of metal wagon. In future years, Isaac Toole and Philemon Gibbs would marvel over the strange things they saw that day. For now, they had a renewed hope that their families might still be saved. It did not seem long at all before they were reunited with the loved ones they had set out to save. Son. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful to now go to some warehouse or museum and find those covered wagons which were fortunate enough to have made it through such a torturous trip and know that the trip was made possible through the fluidity of the endless waters of time. Time continued to remember the Toole family long after this remarkable incident in the form of a remarkable man, Mr. Joseph Toole. Joseph received his first taste of leadership when, as a boy, he was left alone with his family during the nearly disastrous crossing of the desert. Who can say whether the remarkable bending of time played a part in lives yet to be accounted for? This story has been retold so often, it's become what I call urban myth. The elements of the story are consistent with the miraculous interventions our researchers have discovered, which is why we share it with you. As in all the stories we present, we ask you to consider the merits of the event and ask yourself, could it be a miracle? Coming up next, the mysterious appearance of a departed loved one gives new hope to a grieving young woman. Stay tuned for more miracles. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? Our next miracle comes from Michelle's interview with Kelsey Tyler. Kelsey has written several books detailing the miraculous. This story comes from her book, There's an Angel on Your Shoulder. It deals with the idea that our departed loved ones may return in times of need. Uh, one story that involves loved ones who have died and been gone for years, returning in some way to bring reassurance involves a woman named Joni, and uh, she kept up a very close relationship with her father. You. As you get older, things get complicated, and it's not always about trail hikes, nature hikes, bike rides. It stays like this that I want you to remember when things get really tough. But remember always that your dad loves you. Enough of this mushy talk, huh? He Come on, I suffered a terminal go. illness, a terminal bout of cancer, and he died, and that was a very, very hard thing for Joni. Joni? Yeah. I figured you'd be out by the lake on such a gorgeous day. Well, I'm not. Honey, I understand you wanting to take some time from school and regroup, but do you think skipping school is a good idea? You were doing so well. Yeah, and I had a father who loved and supported me, but that's all changed now, hasn't it? I know you miss your dad so much. We all do. But your dad wouldn't want to see you wasting away like this. I know. Mom, can we talk about school later? I really don't feel very well. Sure. We'll talk about it later. Thanks. I love you. I love you too. I can't do this without you. Oh, come on in. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mrs. Everett. Did you come at a bad time? No, you came at a great time. I'm so glad you girls are here. Where is she? She's upstairs in her room, barricaded as usual for the past four months. She's tired of hearing me talk. Maybe you could try. Well, there's two of us and one of her, Mrs. Everett, so don't worry. Okay. You know the way up? Yeah. Why don't you go on? Okay. Thanks. One day she decided to leave for the weekend and go to outside of the city to uh, a beautiful area that she and her father and her mother used to go when they were younger and camp.
Johnny. You okay? I'm just... I'm not sure about this. What, that out of shape, huh? <laughs> no, I just don't have much energy. This place brings back a lot of memories. It's hard. Johnny, this is something you should have done three months ago. It's time. You're right. It's now or never, huh? As she was walking, she saw in front of her, way up ahead on the path, a man. As she was approaching, she thought almost certainly that the man had the look and appearance of her father. Dad? The man uh, said nothing, just looked up at her and smiled and nodded. of reassurance and calm that came over Joni at that moment and she felt that was this her father was this an angel was this just someone who looked like her father <laughs> there you are I thought you'd given up on us you okay yeah did you see him see who the man at the top of the hill no we didn't see anyone <laughs> never mind Must have been my imagination. She left that weekend with an entirely different outlook. She felt peace where she had felt confusion. She felt hope where she'd felt despair before. And she returned to work with a renewed attitude as if she had actually had a visit with her dad. She also felt that um, he was safe and fine wherever he was and that life was gonna be okay. Some of our experts believe that departed loved ones can return in times of need, or perhaps the man in the trench coat was an angel sent to deliver a message in the image of Joni's father, a message that her life would be okay. Either way, the apparition of her father helped Joni go on with her life. She was changed by this experience. Coming up next, a mother's concerns about her son's potentially dangerous new job proved to be real. Stay tuned. has a first name, Buddy. He likes sports like me. He's strong like me. He sleeps on the clouds just a little bit. When he wakes up, he follows me around. Hello and welcome back. In our research and through our interviews with experts in the field of the miraculous, Bob and I have had the opportunity to meet with several interesting, dynamic, and entertaining people. Michelle doesn't like to play favorites, but I have noticed a special smile on her face when the crew is packing for another trip to Chicago and an interview with Joan Wester Anderson. She is a delightful and intelligent woman. And like all of our experts, she offers her own insights into the stories she has researched. In this story, Joan tells us how a mother's prayers may have saved her son's life. story of a young man named Bill Clark who had graduated from high school, decided he didn't want to go to college, and had gone to work as an apprentice for an air conditioning company. Uh, one particular day they were installing air conditioning in a big beautiful palatial house and Bill gave his mom a kiss and went out to work and his mom watched him go and she told me, she said, you know, he's getting older now and I know that I need to kind of let go of him, but I'm not real sure I've finished raising him yet. So she would pray for him frequently, and that morning she said an extra little prayer for him, just asking God to let her know if it was okay to, to let him go. Have a safe day. Hello. Oh, Bill, sweetheart. I forgot your lunch. Oh, thanks, Mom. See you later. I'm 
close to the installation today, Clark. You ready for that? Yep, yeah, sure, I'm ready. All right, after that, I'll take you out to lunch. Mason cooling and heating to fix your air conditioner, ma'am. Oh, uh, come on in. Um, don't forget to wipe your feet. Hey, Clark! What? Get over here, man. I can't see this wiring. Get this plugged in so I can see it. All right. And hurry up. But don't think all day, huh? All right, all right. The wire was actually plugged into a, a socket. It was a live wire. And he was walking backwards with it, unrolling it, and he didn't realize that he was getting closer and closer to the swimming pool that was on the premises. Well, we got work to do. All right, I've almost got it untangled. All of a sudden, he tripped and fell backwards, and still holding the wire, fell into this pool. Well, obviously, if you fall into any water with a live appliance, something that's still plugged in, you get electrocuted. But nothing happened to Bill. He simply, still holding the wire, swam to the edge of the pool and got out. You okay? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that thing was plugged in. I, I thought you were toast. It is plugged in. Mom, can I borrow the dryer? Good heavens. What happened to you? Nothing. I just fell into a pool. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Honey, what happened? Tell me everything. Well, I was pulling a cable and I backed up into a pool. Nothing's nothing's wrong. I'm okay. You're sure you're no, F no fine. Concerned. I'm fine. I'm just just wet. That's all. I just need to borrow the truck. Help yourself, honey. Thanks, Mom. And when Bill got home that night and told his mom about it, of course she gave him a extra hug. But she said it was kind of a little clue to me too that. Bill was being watched over by uh, others than just herself, and it, maybe it was God's way of saying to her, it's time to back off a little bit. He's in good hands. What is important to note here is that the electrical socket was on. The two men checked, and power was running through that wire. So there really is no explanation for how Bill Clark escaped tragedy after falling into the pool with a live wire. Our experts do say that the power of prayer can have a tremendous impact on the outcome of events. Perhaps the prayer by Bill's mother helped save his life. When we come back, a story that gives new meaning to what we call the miracle of birth. Welcome back. Our experts say that miracles happen all around us every moment of the day. We have but to stop and notice the little things we take for granted. Nothing is more common than birth. However, nothing is more miraculous either. I know that the moments I spent in the hospital welcoming my two children into the world were two of the most amazing times of my life. In our next story, a baby enters the world accompanied by some strange events which can only be described as miraculous. The first week of this particular October, the mountainside weather had a dramatic change, and there was no need for them to leave their home anytime soon. Out there. It is. And there's a storm coming. Oh, I'm glad I don't have to go anywhere for the next four weeks. I'll just stay right here. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I brought something. For me? Well, for the baby. Uh, what do you think? <sighs> you have everything figured out, don't you? What school he'll go to. The best. My alma mater. What type of woman he'll marry. Someone just like you. And what position he'll play on the baseball team. Shortstop, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see what he wants to do. Jackson's mother lived next door to the couple, which made it easier for him to check in on her. What do you think? I think you've already made better plans for his career than you did for your own. Well, you can't start too soon, Mom. I'm serious, Jackson. He's not even born yet, and already you've made some big decisions for him. I don't think it's a good idea. 
Well, it's, it's a baby. Let me show you something. Cheryl, here's your husband. When he was eight years old. I must have been really mad when they took that one. You were. Your father had just told you you were going to take piano lessons whether you wanted to or not. Jackson's father had hopes of raising a, a concert pianist. <laughs> Somehow, honey, I don't think you were cut out for that. Well, I wasn't, but Dad had other ideas, you know? You told him what you wanted to do with your life, but he didn't listen, did he? That's what I'm trying to say. Keep an open mind. Well, thanks for lunch, Dorothy. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed the company. By the way, when should you date? Well, the doctors say the 20th, so that's about a month from now. Which is great, because we haven't even started on his room yet. <laughs> What's the matter? I don't know. It's as if someone's nudging me. You must be having contractions. No, it's not that. It's like someone's pushing me from the side. Well, is it the baby? I'm not sure. You must go to the hospital. Oh, I'll be all right. Well, I don't know, Cheryl. I, th I think we should. The weather is starting to kick up a little bit, and we might not be able to get back. <gasps> you are not taking chances with my grandchild. You've got to get down to town now. I mean it. They decided to make a trip to the hospital, and it wasn't long before Cheryl suddenly went into full labor. A moment's delay would have been disastrous. What's happening? She had no warning, no physical sign of her approaching delivery, but the baby was coming nonetheless. As the doctor had feared there was indeed a problem, the umbilical cord was wrapped around the baby's neck, cutting off the fluids on which the baby still relied. I'm afraid we're gonna lose him. Doctor, he's choking to death. We need Ramirez. Is Ramirez still in the building? He left about half an hour ago. He'll never get back in time. I don't believe it. Dr. Ramirez, thank God you're here. I got you covered, Pat. Hi, how you doing? Dr. Ramirez is our resident expert on complications such as this. He'll take good care of you. Baby's going to be just fine. Dr. Ramirez was not scheduled to be in the hospital at this time. But by some strange circumstance, he happened to arrive at exactly the moment he was needed most. So I've been talking to the whole staff, babe. They say they've never seen another delivery quite like this. Well, I'll say. <laughs> Hi, Doc. Hi. You look wonderful. You both look wonderful. And just to think, we just about lost this little guy. You're a lucky little fellow. Glad you got here when you did. So am I. You know, that's the strange part. What's that? Well, I was on my way out the door. Done for the day. See you tomorrow. Then suddenly I felt this push. Like somebody didn't want me to leave the hospital. It was like a, a physical sensation that compelled me. I don't know why. Back to the delivery room. Well, I guess not. It was almost like he called me for help. Hello? Jackson? Oh, hi, Mom. How's she doing? Well, congratulations. Congrat? You're kidding. You're a grandmother to a beautiful, healthy baby boy. Oh! You gotta come down and see him. Well, I'd love to, but... But what? There's been another mudslide. The one road leading to and from town is completely blocked. Well, it would be days before I could get into town. Or for you kids to come home. Uh... I'll call you back, Mom. Honey? Slide. The road's completely closed. If we hadn't driven down when we did, this little guy wouldn't be here. 
Our experts have given us examples of visitations through voices, apparitions, feelings, or hunches. This case would indicate someone or something was making its presence known through the nudging or pushing that Cheryl and the doctor both felt. The element of time can't be overlooked. Jackson and Cheryl needed to get to the hospital before the dangerous mudslide, which would have made the trip impossible. The physical presence felt by Cheryl came at just the right time, giving her just the right message. Michelle and I both feel a connection to these stories every week. It's hard not to, since we're involved with the cases from the research phase through the writing and production of the reenactments, even the interviewing of the authors and witnesses. We hope you've also felt a connection to these miracles. If you've been touched by the stories in our program, if you are weighing the various elements of the cases, you're probably asking yourself the same question we ask at the end of every show. The same question we'll ask again next week. Could it be a miracle? In the last hour, you have witnessed the amazing accounts of ordinary people, people who found themselves against all odds in extraordinary situations. Faced with personal turmoil or physical danger, none of these people were counting on assistance, let alone a miracle. We'll be back next week to present more of these cases and another chance for you to ask yourself, could it be a miracle?